Hello, and welcome to the Narrative Matters podcast, where we hear stories about experiences with the healthcare system and the people in it that highlight the important policy issues of today. I'm Jessica Bylander. Today, I'm talking to Chandra Keller, a lead social science analyst in the Division of Behavioral and Social Research at the National Institute on Aging in Bethesda, Maryland. In this month's Narrative Matters essay, Keller writes about her uncle's death following a medical error and her frustration with a health system that is not set up to learn from mistakes. When her uncle died four days after an outpatient surgical procedure, Keller went to great lengths to put together the pieces of what happened and to set the record straight about what had caused his death. She learned that his death was due to a medical error and could have been prevented. Yet no one took responsibility, and without system change, the mistake could happen to someone else. Chandra, thank you for joining us today and for sharing this story, and I'm very sorry for your loss. I want to acknowledge that there's a bit of a sense of hopelessness in your essay, um, because preventable medical errors are this persistent problem. Can you talk more about where this sense of helplessness came from? Yeah, sure. And uh, thank you so much for having me and for this opportunity um, I, I admit there there was a sense of hopelessness to this essay, and um, you know part of it came from when I started to do this sort of digging and research, and I you know saw that that landmark report, report to Air as Human by the Institute of Medicine happened in 2000, which seems like a long time ago, and and yet there didn't seem to be much progress made. Um, that was that was very discouraging, and then. And then in a personal sense, too, I felt like any avenue I tried to pursue to either get answers or understanding or any responsibility was met with dead ends. Um, so I, I did feel like there wasn't much recourse. And in truth, writing this essay, you know, whether or not it was going to be accepted anywhere for publication, this was sort of my action because I felt like there wasn't much else I could do in a, in a meaningful way. So um, my hope is that if a few, even if just a few people read this and learn from it and are able to better advocate for their own loved ones, then it will have been worth it. Yeah, I'm wondering, in addition to sort of spreading the word in that way, what would give you a sense of hope? Sort of what changes would you want to see in health systems that might indicate that experiences like yours might not continue to be normal or considered normal? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, I... I, (laughs) There's, there's so many structural and institutional barriers, I think, to the current healthcare system in, in its fragmented way that prevent that from happening. But in an ideal world, I would love to see, you know, a situation in which deaths like this were discussed and openly learned from, including, you know, taking into account the experiences of the patient and family member, which I know is really difficult to do. Um, but again, um, I, I feel like that would be an ideal way forward. I don't know if it's possible, but um, that's my hope. Yeah, it makes me think of things like the Maternal Mortality Review Committee. So just sort of, sort of um, taking a look back and seeing what went wrong um, right. could be very instructive. Right. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, and now here is Chandra Keller reading her essay, A Health System That Won't Learn From Its Mistakes. My uncle was very dear to me. He was a second father to me, really, when my own father died wholly unexpectedly because of an aggressive cancer at the age of 62. My uncle was a man whose life was measured in laughs, social engagements, and personal connections. Tall, active, and gregarious, he was the life of parties and a person who would regularly go through his address book on a Sunday and call extended family members and lifelong friends to say, hey, what's going on there, and tell funny stories. Over the course of his life, he collected a strong social network and worked to sustain those relationships. He grew up with his siblings on a family farm in a rural town, moved away after graduating from the local college, and taught public school children for more than three decades before retiring. When I was 21, I moved to where he lived, not knowing who I was or where I was going, and my uncle took me in without hesitation. He made my new home a home. He was the reason I knew I would be okay. My uncle's practical jokes were legendary. No one was safe from them. Once, he enticed his students for days with the promise of special ice cream sundae party for the class. When the day came, he cackled with glee. He really did cackle. As his students all took their first enthusiastic bites of the sundaes, only to discover that they were made with mashed potatoes. 
Another time, he pranked called his brother at work on his birthday, pretending to be a customer who needed a rush job that would keep his brother there for hours, but dissolving into laughter as he said, what are you doing at work this late on your birthday, fool? Despite that lightness of spirit, however, my uncle also understood what it meant to be within a hair's breadth of dying. When he was in his 40s, he developed a bacterial infection that triggered his HIV to progress perilously to full-blown AIDS. His social network rallied around him and took care of him. Then his sisters came to stay with him one by one and kept a close eye on his recovery. One of the important things he learned from this experience was the life-saving value of adhering to his medical regimen. He dutifully followed clinician instructions, carefully and correctly took his many medications, checked in regularly with his doctors, and submitted to regular screening and testing. And for decades after his bout with AIDS, he survived. No, not survived. He thrived. He thrived to the point of having an undetectable viral load and playing weekly pickleball games in his early 70s. Then, in December 2020, after spending 10 months alone because of his strict adherence to pandemic-related social isolation and risk mitigation guidelines, my beloved uncle died. Not from AIDS, not from COVID-19, not from old age or Alzheimer's disease or heart attack or stroke. He died alone in a hospital intensive care unit, or ICU, a little more than 12 hours after arriving at the emergency department vomiting, and in tremendous acute abdominal pain four days after an outpatient surgical procedure. He died because his care team, a primary care physician, an anticoagulation clinic pharmacist, and a urologist assigned to perform a cystoscopy with J-stent placement or kidney stone blasting within an integrated managed care consortium was set up to concern themselves only with their own corner of care and not the entirety of my uncle's health. He died because of apparent failures to communicate across silos and to consider the cumulative or interactive effects of individually applied treatments. My uncle had previously had two episodes of pulmonary embolism. He had no known risk factors and the cause was unclear. But after the second occurrence, he was prescribed a maintenance regimen of anticoagulants or warfarin, coupled with regular blood tests and close monitoring. Around the time of the second occurrence, he was also told he had kidney stones that required a cystoscopy procedure. The pharmacist wrote detailed preoperative and postoperative anticoagulation medication orders, stating that he should resume taking warfarin on the night of his outpatient procedure, unless a doctor told him otherwise. Although we no longer lived in the same state, I had my uncle's health care power of attorney. Four days after the cystoscopy procedure, the hospital staff called me late at night, catching me by surprise. They needed my consent for treatment and had called me only after he was no longer consentable. I was not given the opportunity to speak with him. I spoke with a hospital interventional radiologist several times that night. She seemed alarmed by my uncle's condition and informed me with certainty that taking warfarin so soon after the kidney procedure would likely be catastrophic. It was. The combination of recent surgery and immediate resumption of blood thinners resulted in irreparable internal bleeding into the retroperitoneal space. My night was filled with multiple urgent, emotional, and impossible calls with several different doctors reporting to me the escalation of a grim situation and asking me what I wanted them to do. Each time, the doctors insisted that my uncle must have mistakenly taken the warfarin after his procedure or taken it against physician's orders. It was a double blow to digest the distressing information about my uncle's rapidly deteriorating condition and listen to the clinicians assume that he was responsible for it. He died a few hours after the radiologist attempted a procedure to repair or remove his kidney, which she described as weeping blood everywhere. In my last phone call with the ICU physician in the early morning hours, I begged him to tell my uncle I loved him before he slipped away, just in case he could hear. The system failed my uncle, and the price was his life. After my uncle's death, I launched my own investigation into what occurred. I made dozens of phone calls with the involved healthcare providers or their office staff and took detailed notes of our conversations. The urologist who performed the kidney procedure said my uncle was told to resume the warfarin two to seven days after the surgery. 
but that the urologist was not the one who told him to restart the medication. The urologist said he didn't know who did. I called the anticoagulation clinic, and the pharmacist there told me, and I quote, The instruction should have been to resume that evening on the day of the kidney procedure. The doctor can override those instructions depending on how the procedure goes. But sure, we told him to resume. That, but sure, really got me. It was so casual and cavalier. Sure, we told him to take the medication that killed him. When I explained that the hospital doctors insisted that restarting the warfarin is what caused his death, the pharmacist had nothing to say. I also spoke to a clinic care coordinator at my uncle's primary care physician's office. He was laconic in his responses and sounded unfazed by the whole situation. I got no helpful information or acknowledgement of any coordination or information sharing between the providers. He doesn't know anything, I wrote in my notes from that call. Didn't even know he passed away. Didn't have any knowledge of any interaction between his office and the anticoagulation clinic and or the urologist. I had a debrief call with the hospital interventional radiologist the day after my uncle died. She said that an autopsy would be interesting and then clarified, maybe that is the wrong word. It will be informative to get a report about what was going on microscopically or at the blood vessel level to cause the kidney to fall apart like that. Hopefully we can learn from this. Long prior to this event, my uncle provided me with access to all his accounts. So next I reviewed his electronic health record or EHR. I found a message from my uncle to the clinic care coordinator at the primary care physician's office before the scheduled surgery, asking whether the plans for the kidney procedure and continued warfarin treatment were safe. No concerns were relayed back to him in response. My uncle's post-operative warfarin instructions from the anticoagulation clinic show that he was told to resume the medication on the night of his procedure unless told otherwise, as the pharmacist had stated. The discharge documents from the hospital include warfarin among the medications he was to resume after the procedure. No alternative instructions were in the EHR or the hard copy discharge orders that I found in his home. The county coroner called me a couple hours after my uncle died and said that she did not think his case warranted an autopsy. But the information she had already received from the hospital was incorrect and incomplete. I respectfully explained that the interventional radiologist had described the severity of bleeding as something that she had never seen before, and I provided the coroner with more details. After hearing my input and speaking directly with one of the ICU doctors, the coroner changed her mind and agreed to authorize the autopsy. After the autopsy, the pending cause of death listed self-medicated Coumadin therapy as one in the chain of causal factors. I again patiently explained the medication orders my uncle had received, and she invited me to submit additional documentation, which I did. My report of conversations with each doctor, the hospital discharge instructions, the pharmacist instructions for resuming medication, and a communication in his EHR from the pharmacist instructing him to resume warfarin. After further review of this documentation, the coroner removed the phrase self-medicated from the chain of events that caused my uncle's death. Still, the death certificate indicated that his death was an accident resulting from complications from a medical procedure. The removal of self-medicated felt like a small, hollow victory. It removed a shadow of blame from my uncle, but assigned no responsibility to the health system for this preventable error. And of course, it did not make him any less dead. I was so grateful to the coroner for being open to my input But at the same time, it was disheartening to see how hard I had to work to correct misinformation each step of the way. Preventable medical errors and failures in care coordination remain ubiquitous in U.S. healthcare, despite concerted attention on patient safety since, and even before, the publication of the landmark report to Air is Human by the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, in 2000. 20 years later, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or ARC, report, Making Healthcare Safer 3, a critical analysis of existing and emerging patient safety practices, devoted an entire chapter to harms due to anticoagulants. The 2020 report notes that patients are particularly vulnerable to harms from anticoagulant errors when being transitioned from one setting to another. It contains a review of the evidence for interventions to support safe transitions of patients using anticoagulants after discharge, which found a paltry five studies that met inclusion criteria. The report concludes, 
The available studies on safety practices for discharging patients on anticoagulants from hospitals and EDs are extremely few and reflect poor quality evidence. The burden is apparently on the patient and the patient's family, both to coordinate the patient's care proactively without any personal medical knowledge and to conduct their own investigation after an adverse event occurs. After my uncle died, many of his former students wrote on our electronic memory board for him. He will always be one of my absolute favorite teachers of all time, one former student wrote. He made history and literature fun and engaging in ways that only he could. He exuded a magnetic energy that always made him the absolute most fun to be around. I am a proudly out gay man today, and his influence at that point in my life was huge and critical. I didn't truly know it or understand then, but what I saw in him was complete confidence in simply and authentically being himself. His impact across thousands of students over the years is incredible and for me personally momentous. I do not have a happy ending to this story. My uncle is still gone. No one took responsibility for the gaps in care and lack of coordination and communication that led to his preventable death. I spoke with three medical malpractice attorneys about my options. Each of them bluntly told me that it would be a weak claim because he was my uncle as opposed to a parent or a spouse and limits to general damages meant that it was not worth their effort. One of them simply said, I'll pass. What's even worse than not being able to hold anyone accountable is that no one will learn from this mistake because information is not shared and there is no venue for the providers and patient family members to collectively review the facts. The hospital interventional radiologist comments to me after his death reverberated in my thoughts for a long time. Hopefully, we can learn from this. The only response I had to that in my mind was, how? I was never contacted to provide my input or to participate in a debrief so that others could learn from this sequence of events. Is the health system in which these events unfolded set up to learn from this? ARC defines a learning health system as one in which internal data and experience are systematically integrated with external evidence, and that knowledge is put into practice. As a result, patients get higher quality, safer, more efficient care, and healthcare delivery organizations become better places to work. Actions of a learning health system include promoting the inclusion of patients as vital members of the learning team and capturing and analyzing data and care experiences to improve care. Based on my experience, it does not appear to me that the health system in which my uncle was a patient is structured to be a learning health system, at least not in a transparent way that meaningfully involves the experiences of the patient or their family. So what do I think should have been done instead? One member of my uncle's care team should have taken proactive responsibility for coordinating his care and ensuring accountability among the providers and healthcare settings. The primary care physician should have been in direct communication with the patient, anticoagulation pharmacist, urologist, and hospital staff to determine a safe approach for the resumption of warfarin after kidney surgery. In an ARC patient safety network case study, Jennifer Branch and colleagues note, accountability breakdowns occur when there is no primary provider to take responsibility for assuring that the patient's care is coordinated across multiple settings with all providers. Lack of effective communication among multiple providers or between provider and patient may result in medication errors. A regimen for decreasing the warfarin dosage in the days leading up to the surgery was clearly laid out and monitored by the pharmacist and strictly followed by my uncle. But it is as if no one even thought about what would happen at discharge after the procedure. A reasonable person would think that his age, HIV status and related polypharmacy, and use of anticoagulants would signal to his providers the need for stringent, proactive care management. The EHR for any patient receiving anticoagulants who is recommended for surgery should boldly alert all providers of the need for increased scrutiny and care coordination, both leading up to and after a surgical procedure. But none of this happened. My uncle died and left his family without the joy he brought to our lives, with no one apologizing or taking responsibility. There are more patients and families in similar situations who have few opportunities for recourse. And it is not just the health and human impact that matters. 
Failures in care transitions, fragmented care, and medication management errors are still contributing significantly to the billions of dollars wasted annually in U.S. healthcare spending. Preventable medical errors are not necessarily caused by one individual, but can occur because of structural features of the healthcare system that do not facilitate a culture of safety or a culture of continual learning. Systems level approaches such as EHR automation and machine learning, consistent collection of adverse event data that informs practice, patient and family engagement, and better care coordination are needed to reduce preventable medical errors and improve patient outcomes. And when errors do happen, we need systems that incorporate the lived experience of the patient and family into the process of learning from those mistakes. That was Chandra Keller reading her essay a health system that won't learn from its mistakes. Thanks for listening to the Health Affairs Narrative Matters podcast. If you like this episode, tell a friend and be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts.